The first time that the Prophet's birthday was celebrated as a public event, i.e., the Mawlid al Nabi or the Milad al Nabi as we call it, the first time that it was celebrated, the authorities who celebrated it chose the 12th of Rabi' al Awwal. And because they chose the 12th of Rabi' al Awwal, now that's it, it just spread like wildfire. The day and the event and the custom. Now I have written a detailed article about the history of the Mawlid and who started it and how did it become popular. Uh, and just to summarize, the Mawlid or the Milad nabi the first recorded instance that we have of anybody celebrating Milad nabi is around 517 Hijrah. 517 Hijrah, i.e. the 6th century of Islam. So for 500 years, the concept of celebrating the birthday of the Prophet is simply unknown to the Muslims. They cannot, because celebrating birthdays is not a custom that comes from Islam or from, I'm not saying it's haram by the way, I'm saying it's not something that the Arabs would do. They wouldn't record birthdays to celebrate them in the first place, right? Many of you, I know my own grandmother had no idea when she was born. They didn't record these things. It was not something of significance to them. The day and the month and the year that you were born. This is a Western concept that is now modern. Everybody records it. But that was not something that, if you even ask your own grandparents, many of them would not know. You know, it's not something that was recorded. And so, the concept of celebrating it is a very late addition. And the first group that celebrated it were the Fatimids of Egypt. And the Fatimids uh, are a dynasty that are not of Sunni theology. The Fatimids are the ancestors of, in today's time, the Aga Khanis and the Buhra, the Ismailis. Uh, the Fatimids are the, the ancestors of these groups, Shia groups. And for a number of years, they ruled over Egypt. The Fatimid dynasty ruled over Egypt. And they instituted over 30, 40 festivals. And of course, there's a reason why rulers have festivals. Why do people have festivals? What does it do? Distracting and economy, people come and buy and sell, popularity of whatever is called the nation state in our times or in their times the ruling family, right? So there's a reason why the ruling class want to have public festivals. There's a, there's a uh, philosophy behind it and the Fatim has had over 30 or 40 public festivals throughout the Every few weeks there was a major event and festival and they celebrated Ghadir Khum, they celebrated 10th of Muharram, these are all Shia festivals. They celebrated the birth of this Imam, the death of that Imam. And of those celebrations, it is said, they celebrated the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu This is the first time in Islamic history that we come across the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As I said, 517 Hijrah, 517. And the people who are doing it are these Fatimids. And as we said, there's clearly a motive for them to do it. When it was done in Fatimid Egypt, then 150 years later, some Sunni governors thought this was a good idea and they imported this particular festival. And because it was done in Egypt on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, Egypt at that time was a Fatimid state, they imported it to Mosul, which is outside of, uh, of Baghdad, it's a place in Iraq. The first uh, Sunni governor, he was not a Khalifa, the first Sunni governor who celebrated uh, the Mawlid, celebrated it around 670 or so Hijrah. So for 670 years, this was unknown in the Muslim world to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet And this celebration was done once again on the 12th and it became a very luxurious festival. And various governors and rulers would then compete with each other who could have the bigger festival and the grander festival. Free meat and free uh, uh, bread and, and free, you know, uh, gifts were given out and people, so it became a, a, a literally a national festival. And as I said, there are reasons why rulers want to do this, and so they began to compete with one another in order to attract the, the trade, the commerce, just like now. Why do governments want the Olympics to happen in their country? Right? Why do governments want the World Cup to come to their country? There's reasons. There, we need to be a little bit more uh, reading in here. And so the governors wanted these festivals to become the biggest, so each one wants theirs to be bigger and bigger. And of course, it's the birthday of the process, and who's ever going to say anything about that? And so slowly but surely, from 660 AH, it began to spread in, in Sunni lands. Initially, some scholars opposed it. Some scholars you know, said, well, if you do it with these conditions, it's okay. After a while, under public pressure, just the floodgates opened, and it became a very, very common uh, festival. And you all know my opinion on this is that uh, the way to celebrate 
the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ, if, if you really wanted to celebrate it, is to fast on Mondays. Because that's what he would do. If you really want to celebrate his birthday, then you should fast every Monday. Because when he was asked, why do you fast on Monday? He said, because I was born on a Monday. So to take one day of the year and do events and whatnot, I mean, I'm not going to be harsh here, but let me just say, it's a really easy cop-out to show that you're loving the Prophet ﷺ, if you do something one day. Real love is to be dedicated throughout the year, right? Real love is to show that love every single day, and not just one day of the year by giving some money and going to a festival. Nonetheless, so because the first time that the Mawlid was celebrated was the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, what happened? It became the date associated in the minds of the people. For 600 years in Islam, no Muslim scholar, no major uh, Muslim kh Khalifa, no uh, theologian, scholar of Hadith Fiqh, ever spoke about the concept of celebrating the birthday because they had no idea of something called a birthday. The concept of celebrating a birthday is not an Islamic concept. It didn't come to their minds. So for 600 years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, nobody in the entire Muslim lands, Islam Muslim, we're not talking about Christians with Christmas, Muslims are not celebrating the birthday of the Prophet. ﷺ. Why? Abu Hanifa, none of them. Buhari, Muslim. None of them. Because the concept was not even in their heads. Mm -hmm. They didn't warn against it either because nobody did it. Yeah. You understand? They did it. It's like the thing doesn't even arise in their heads that somebody would do that. It's non-existent. Then, in the year around 620 something or so, one of the uh, you know uh, mystical groups, the Sufi groups, one of them in the fringes of the of the Muslim Ummah, they decided to do this this deed. And some scholars say that this act, the thought of it, came from celebrating Christmas. That when the Christians show respect to Jesus Christ, then these guys thought that they could do better and show respect to the Prophet by celebrating his birthday. Okay, and so it was started at the fringe of the Ummah in the areas of Khorasan, far, far away. And then it caught and spread like wildfire in the next 200 years. It took two centuries. And in the beginning, most of the scholars were opposed to it. And we have many scholars who actually wrote fatwa against it. Some of them said, oh, this is a really strange thing. It's a bid'ah, it's an innovation, but there's also some good that the Muslims come together and they were mentioned the Prophet ﷺ, they send salat and salam upon him. And of the people who said this is a very famous scholar, Ibn Hajar. Ibn Hajar al asqalani the famous Ibn Hajar. He said, this is a bid'ah. The Prophet ﷺ never did it. But there's good in it as well because people come together and they mention Allah and the Prophet and they just talk about the seerah, etc, etc. So, others opposed and they said, no, there can't be any such thing as a good bid'ah. This whole concept of good bid'ah doesn't, uh, doesn't occur to them. So, in our times, it's become a huge controversy. And those who affirm it become compassionate, those who deny it be compassionate, each group accuses the other of this and that. I just have a simple question. Can you outdo the companions in your love for the Prophet ﷺ? Can you do better than Abu Bakr and Umar? No way. Well then, why don't you just stick with their way? I'm not even getting into, is it haram, bid'ah, shirk, I'm not saying anything. I'm just asking a simple question. Isn't it safer? That's all I'm asking. Isn't it safer to stick with the earliest generations and how they love the Prophet ﷺ? When something is so much controversy, you've got so much heated debates, isn't it better to just stick with how Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum, how Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, how they did it? And you know how they did it? They followed the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the way to show your love. You know why people love the birthday of the Prophet Because it gives them a false sense of I love the Prophet I'm going to do on this day what I do on no other day of the year. But that's the whole point. You're supposed to love the Prophet every day of the year. And you show that love by following his life and teachings. So every day should be celebrating the birth of the Prophet How? By doing what he told you to do. That's how you celebrate. The, the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. That's how you show your love. Not by and that's why people love it so much. And I'll be just honest here, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is a psychological thing. That it's, it's, it's basically, it's like a placebo. It makes you feel good, yeah. right? It makes you feel good is that, oh, I'm showing my love by doing this on this day. I'm going to spend money on this day, I'm going to do this. But you know, for the rest of the year, you do nothing. Well, then that's a problem, isn't it? That's a big problem. And it, 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 you understand why people are so emotional about celebrating this one day, because they feel that if I defend this, I'm defending the love of the Prophet ﷺ. No, if you really loved the Prophet ﷺ, your lifestyle would be in accordance with his.